Good morning. Welcome to the Nevada Historical Society's History Talks in association with Art Town. My name is Linda Burke and I am the Vice President of the Docent Council, a volunteer group here at the Nevada Historical Society, Nevada's oldest cultural institution located on the University of Nevada Reno campus. Today it is my pleasure to introduce Catherine McGee, the Director of the Nevada Historical Society since 2016. Catherine is a third generation Nevadan and she has a Master's in Art Conservation from the University of Delaware and a doctorate in geography from the University of Nevada, Reno. Catherine lived in Washington, D.C. for 15 years, where she worked as an art conservator at the Smithsonian Institute, specializing in archaeological conservation in Asia, Central America, the Mediterranean Basin, and North Africa. Some of you may have heard Catherine speak on the effects of settlement and tourism on the Washoe tribe of Nevada. Today, she will share with us something a little different. I give you Dr. Catherine McGee and the psychedelic blue jean sex machine, Northern Nevada's contributions to pop culture. Good morning. I'm really pleased to be here and share some of Northern Nevada's contributions to pop culture. If I were live, I'd be asking you to tell me your vision and impressions of Nevada. So I hope that you'll share your thoughts in the comments section and we can talk about these at the end of my presentation. So given the title of this talk, we're going to explore conceptions and misconceptions about Nevada history and how our state's notorious reputation has had a global impact on pop culture. The Nevada Historical Society was founded in 1904 by Professor Jean Weir to preserve Nevada's and the West's vanishing cultural heritage, the notorious and notable as exemplified here by Datsola Lee and the Grosch brothers, with objects, archives, and photographs from the Nevada Historical Society collections. Now, moving on to the notorious. Activities illegal in other states were promoted and above all legal in Nevada. The Johnson Jeffries fight was not the first price fight in Nevada, but the fight of the century as it became to be known helped legitimize the sport that we see today. Gambling happened and still happens globally, but Reno and the legalization of gambling in Nevada in 1931 normalized and glamorized this millennia old pastime. So brothels, gambling, divorce, prize fights are just some of the key components of Nevada developing into an economy based on sin. Nevada has long been an environment for creativity, independence, experimentation, and entrepreneurship. Invented in Virginia City, the Diedensheimer Square Set Timber became an international standard for mining for the next 50 years. Nevada became a territory and state during the Western expansion of the United States and is identified with the gunslinging image of the West. In particular, Virginia City became identified with the Wild West through pop culture. The TV show Bonanza featured the fictional Ponderosa Ranch and shaped millions of people's conception of the West, causing what I like to call a bonanzification of Virginia City. Enter the psychedelic 60s. I hear you asking, psychedelic music, San Francisco, the Grateful Dead, Janis Joplin, light shows, what do these have to do with a desert town in Nevada? Well, to quote Joel Selvin's 2015 SF Gate article, the San Francisco 60s rock scene started with a band you've never heard of, meaning the charlatans, and I would add in a place you would never believe, Virginia City, Nevada. So Virginia City allowed for freedom of experimentation freedom of invention, and inspired the charlatans and the extended group called the Family Dog to create an imagined Edwardian era Wild West, replete, replete with guns and a Miss Kitty type saloon proprietress. And here we see um, 1960s era Virginia City and, and, and a photo of the charlatans. We were characters that sat around in the saloon down the street waiting for the boss to come and tell us to wrestle the little girls, 
cattle, so she couldn't meet the mortgage payment. This is a quote from Rockin' at the Red Dog, a great documentary by Mary Works Covington and Shan Laughlin, who's kind of the fixer of the family dog, made this quote. And I think you can see that um, the picture of the charlatans up there look like they're ready, they're ready to uh, wrestle some cattle. Band member Richard Olson said, when we got to the Red Dog, our persona really started coming together because of the Western influence of Virginia City. The creativity sparked by Virginia City not only inspired the charlatans look, and music, it also inspired Bill Hamm and Bob Cohen to create the first light show, and Mike Ferguson and George Hunter to create The Seed, the first psychedelic rock poster. Now, for those of you knowing the 60s and the San Francisco sound, I think it would be impossible to imagine either a show without a light show or these amazing psychedelic posters that were basically invented in Virginia City. The anniversary of the Charlatans' historic 1965 summer at the Red Dog Saloon was celebrated at the Nevada Historical Society in 2015. The Sagebrush Psychedelic Exhibit by Ingrid Barnett honored the Charlatans, their founding of the San Francisco Sound, the Red Dog Saloon, Don Works, co-founder of the Red Dog, and his daughter Mary Works Covington, who produced the documentary film Rocking at the Red Dog. Pop culture helped create 20th century Virginia City, and in turn, 20th century Virginia City helped create pop culture. At the Red Dog in 1965, Lynn Hughes, one of the members of the family dog, her role was the Miss Kitty character, directly referring to the saloon proprietress and harlot with a heart character from Gunsmoke. So I think you can see in this slide where the charlatans got inspiration. And if you look at, this slide is a, a image of the historic Delta Saloon from the late 1800s. And in the 1800 mining camp saloons were important. They served as everything from post office to funeral parlor. And they provided escapist pleasures from the dangers the miners faced, including gambling and prostitutes. Brothel prostitution in Nevada was not suppressed and came out of the mining boom towns. Prostitution in Nevada has never not been illegal. And if that sounds murky, so is the history of the legality of prostitution. Women followed the miners because the boom towns offered opportunities for these entrepreneurial women. And beloved prostitute Julia Bulette, seen here, is remembered today with a Virginia City Saloon named in her honor. Enforcement and regulation of prostitution was mostly left to the local sheriff. As mining camps turned into towns, more respectable institutions came in, such as churches and schools. Prostitution zoning and regulations were instituted, stating brothels couldn't be within 400 yards of a school or on the town's main street. So some towns move the main street, the churches, or the schools to keep brothels in action. Today, prostitution is legal in 12 of the 17 counties, but that wasn't always the case. Until 1949, prostitution was practiced legally statewide. But if Nevada's founding fathers would have had their way, prostitution would have been unequivocally legal in 1871. In Reno, there's an official red light district was created in 1879. In 1923, the red light district was between Center Street and Second Street, north of the Truckee River. And this is where the famed Reno stockades were with its 150 prostitutes operating out of about 80 cribs. The early 20th century saw an economic gain, an interest in the Wild West, and the first implemented institutional leave or paid holidays. So now the middle class had both time and money. And with industrialization, men married later and some sought the company of prostitutes. However, Reno's brothels and the Las Vegas red light district known as Block 16 were victims of the World War II May Act prohibiting prostitution near military bases. The 
49 Nevada Supreme Court ruling shut down a Reno brothel on Commercial Row as a nuisance, ushering in the era of the nuisance law as a way to get rid of brothels. The May Act temporarily ended overt government sanctioning of prostitution, but it did not outlaw it. So these laws caused the shift of brothel prostitution to primarily rural areas. And by 1949, prostitution is explicitly illegal in Washoe and Clark counties. Infamous brothel owner, Joe Conforti, caused the official legalization of brothels in 1971. And he had a lot of battles with then assistant district attorney, Bill Raggio. And this saw Conforti's brothels continuously shut down under the nuisance laws. In 1970, Conforti was ordered to pay back Story County for the cost of law enforcement patrols that ensured his houses were closed, and he paid this. And then he continued to pay the cost of patrols to ensure his houses were open legally and legitimately. However, Story County needed to make the law from Conforti legal. Otherwise, it looked like a bribe to keep his brothels open. So this law was passed under shady circumstances in the last minute midnight deal done by two outgoing Story County commissioners, thus creating the first law legalizing a brothel in 1971. And as a lot of us old Renoites referred to him, Uncle Joe, he uh, figured out a way around the laws and made them work in his favor. So in 1985, George Flint forms the Nevada Brothel Association and hopes to give legitimacy to the business through lobbying state legislatures for favorable laws for brothels. So basically, they pushed to make prostitution more legitimate through taxation. So with official legalization and striving for legitimization also comes a change to the brothel owners. And according to Flint, most new owners at that time, 80s, 90s, were squares, meaning the businessmen from, were from outside of the sex trade. It was illegal for brothels to be advertised in direct traditional ways. So brothels used CB radios to entice truckers and relied heavily on promotional items, such as this token from the Pussycat Ranch. And in 2007, the Square owners promoted their business statewide when the advertising ban on brothels was lifted. And I certainly can remember this because I remember the first time I saw a Mustang Ranch sign on a taxi, I was, I was kind of surprised there. So with the new laws and new owners, we see 24 hour gift shop, free tours, and you know what, no sex required. So basically this implicit illicit of prostitution has become a visible vice and has an impact on pop culture. Brothels are featured on serious radio shows. Brothels are on Twitter. An HBO TV show featured prostitutes from the Bunny Ranch in the series Cat House. And of course, brothel websites have video tours available on YouTube. Well, we've done the psychedelic and we've done the sex. So now on to blue jeans. Can you imagine the world without Levi's or jeans? I know I sure can't. This pop culture icon was invented and gained global acclaim because of Reno. Because he couldn't afford the patent for his pants, inventor Jacob Davis had to partner with Levi Strauss, who was the supplier of the fabric for his pants. A tailor by training, Jacob Davis was born in what is today Riga, Latvia, and came to the U.S. in 1854, seeking his fortune in the California and Alaska gold rushes and Nevada's Comstock load. He eventually settled in Reno and opened a tailor shop on Virginia Street. Now, Jacob Davis was an inventor, and he had three previous patents. One was for the improvement in ironing and stretching boards, one was a steam-powered canal boat, and one was for a steam-powered ore crusher. English, obviously, was Davis's second language, and a neighbor helped him write the letter 
to Levi Strauss asking to partner on the patent. So the excerpt of the letter is here and describes his secret. The secret of them pants is the rivets that I put in those pockets, and I found the demand so large that I cannot make them up fast enough. I charge for the duck $3 and the blue $2.50 a pair. My neighbors are getting jealous of, this, of these success, and unless I secure it by patent papers, it will soon become a general thing. I really like that because you can see that um, the person who was helping him write also had a little, you know, English wasn't their first language, but I think it really gets across, you know, why these pants were so um, popular and it was the rivet on the pockets that made them durable. So here you see Jacob Davis. This is pretty much as far as we know, the only photo of him. And um, then there's an image of the historic plaque where his tailor shop was in Reno. So what do the actress Rita Hayworth, General Douglas MacArthur, the illustrator Norman Rockwell, and the mobster Bug Bugsy Siegel have to do with jeans? Well, each got a Reno divorce. And over the course of 70 years, scores of movie stars, writers, politicians, industrialists, artists, and celebrities of all types did the same. I like this image because, frankly, um, it has a picture of Mary Astor, um, sorry, Maggie Astor, who was planning to marry a man in England after her divorce, but she got involved with Nevada State Museum director Tony Green while she was staying at the Flying M.E. Ranch. And I just like the fact that she got involved with the museum director here, which is pretty fabulous. Nevada continually shortened the divorce residency requirements because divorce was lucrative for the state. And in 1931, during the Great Depression, the state legislature dropped the residency requirement to an unheard of six weeks. So what's interesting is other states and other countries were vying for this divorce trade. And um, so 1915, you can see the bill on the typewriter was for a six month requirement but that kept getting shortened to six weeks. And um, eventually it was called the Reno Cure. So when divorce seekers from across the U.S. came to Reno, they needed clothes fit for their residency at dude ranches. And jeans were tough, practical, and comfortable. So when the society influencers returned home, if they didn't end up staying in Nevada, that is, they returned home with jeans and in turn introducing them to their friends and into pop culture. Originally, jeans were for men, laborers specifically, and class and cultural distinctions were extremely rigid at this point in time. According to Levi's historian Tracy Panic, independent-minded women and others who first donned jeans might even be considered a bit edgy. The 1935 Levi's ad in Vogue promotes this counterculture image of jeans while making a not-so-subtle nod to divorce, referencing the dude ranch. So here I'm going to read an excerpt from that ad and it's the part that's outlined in green. So it states, a cowboy without Levi's is not a cowboy. Naturally, since they are so much in evidence at the dude ranches, the guests have adopted them. And so you have the newest outdoor vogue for women, Levi's, worn by the knowing, not merely on dude ranches, but at the most exclusive resorts beaches and camps throughout the country. Lady Levi's, called 701s, became wildly popular during the heyday of dude ranches. And according to Tracy Panic, the jeans were more than a fashion statement. They were a political one. So the Reno Cure offered freedom. Women's equality continued its steady social and cultural progress in the 1930s. Thus, the Northern Nevada-based divorce industry helped create a global pop culture icon, jeans, while promoting women's rights. I hope you've enjoyed this quick tour through some amazing Nevada history, and I hope to see you at the Nevada Historical Society. Thank you, Catherine. Very interesting talk there, quite a lot of issues brought up. I have a couple of questions for you, Catherine. Is the Red Dog Saloon still in Virginia City today? 
Yes, it is still in Virginia City today. And it um, also has music and it's a great place to go. And um, who was the art cartoons depicting in the? Um, there were a couple of different artists. One was Yule and another one was, um, oh my gosh, why am I blinking? I think, was it Lou Heimer? Heimer, yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lou Heimer, yes. We had an exhibit. Yeah, we had an exhibit on him, didn't we? Yeah, we yes. did. We have a lot of his materials. And the other one was Art Yule. Art and we have Yule. some of his materials here as well. And is, okay. is, the, is the documentary on the charlatans available for viewing? Um, I have watched it on YouTube, and I believe that you can still, you can purchase it uh, um, on Amazon, and I'm not sure if you go to the Red Dog website if they have a have it available for purchase. I, I was and surprised to see that Levi's for Women took off because if I remember right, girls couldn't wear pants in school until like the late 50s. Mm -hmm. and, and women just, I mean, you certainly couldn't wear them to work. <laughs> for, quite, for quite a long time right well um i mean that's the whole thing with like the dude ranches leisure um there's this whole um concept of the wild west and the cowboy and um then levi's doing a lot of promotion with their advertisements of that time to um promote um pants and jeans but um, actually, even before that, in um, World War I, they um, produced an article of clothing called the Freedom Alls. And we actually at the Nevada Historical Society have one of the a very rare pair of Freedom Alls. And basically, it, um, it was a, a pants and a jacket that looked kind of military-ish. Um, and um, that was the first pants that Levi's made specifically for women. And um, I probably come up with an image, but just um, for those of you that are Downton Abbey fans, um, when Edith rides a bike to the farmer to help him um, pull a tractor during World War I, she is wearing basically what are very similar to Freedom Alls. Interesting. Well, of course, women who were uh, horseback riders, even English saddle, uh, wore Jodhpurs, I think they were called. Yeah. They wore skirts too, depending on what yeah, they Yeah, yeah. I remember my grandmother putting on a, it's almost like a mechanic's outfit where you stepped into the slacks and the, and the top was attached mm -hmm. and you buttoned it up. But she didn't leave the property. <laughs> she put a dress on before she got in the car and went anywhere. Right. Well, I think that's where, you know, Tracy Panic's quote, where she said the women that were wearing them were even considered a little bit edgy. Um, you know, it was a political statement at the time. Um, uh -huh. You know, women's freedoms were, you know, continuing on. It was after, you know, the vote and continued with the suffragette um, era. So a lot of these things, including, you know, kind of come together. So like the divorce, the um, women's rights, freedom. Um, freedom of clothing, um, all these different um, kind of issues come come together to create to create more freedoms in these different aspects. Of oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, Catherine Scott Sani would want us to know who started the tradition of throwing your wedding ring off the Virginia Street Bridge after a divorce. Well, I don't know that we actually know the first person that did that, but it definitely is a tradition. Um, it's kind of interesting because we have a, 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 a Neil Cobb who does High Noon. He said he and his friends used to, you know, go down to the Truckee River at low tide or when the, when the river was low to look for rings. And he said they only found Cracker Jack, you know, rings. So maybe people didn't really do it. Um, I've heard some other stories from some other people that have come into the historical society and they said they found a lot of gold rings um, near the uh, Virginia Street Bridge. Right, so yeah. uh, I, I, I do not think it's a myth. I think that it happened, but I know I would, um, I would be interested to see if people still find rings today. 
yeah. <laughs> also, um, someone wants to know, you showed a Virginia City map with a red light district. Was there a red light district by the fourth ward school in Virginia City? In Yes, I presume in Virginia City. Well, no. Um, because of the laws that were created, when, when the mining towns or mining camps became towns and they had more regulation. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they regulated was the location of brothels couldn't be near more respectable institutions like churches and schools. So that's one of the reasons why red light districts in certain cities move or, um, or are done away with. So in that image, there was a picture of the Barbary Coast and the red light district, which are both kind of notorious um, areas of Virginia City. But because of the laws, they couldn't be within, um, the laws changed throughout the years, but basically 400 yards of these respectable institutions. Um, could you repeat again the streets where the downtown brothels were in Reno? Um, there, um, I have to look at my notes. Center sure. Street or something, Center Street and... Yeah, so, so again, um, the red light district in Reno moved um, again, but it, it was always north of the, um, north of the Truckee River. Um, the Reno stockades were on commercial um, um, between Center Street and Second Street. Uh, and then it, it moved a little further east um, in the later, in the later, um, in the 20s. So that was in the 19, uh, 1890s, I think. And then later on, it moved a little bit further east. So basically, um, if people are familiar with where the, um, the baseball stadium is now, that's where the red light district was. Thank you again for attending and hope to see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.